Um, welcome to tonight's lecture um, arranged by the Center for Asian and Middle Eastern Studies in partnership with the School Academy. I'm your host, Masoom. Uh, tonight we have our first lecture on the new series, Decolonizing Social Sciences from Uniplexity to Multiplexity. This is a seven part series, which is taking place on a fortnightly basis. The aim of the series is to understand contem contemporary social science in light of fiqh, which is a form of um, social uh, Islamic jurisprudence. Before the, before the lecture, a brief um, about the Center for Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. The Center for Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, CANIS for short, is a nonpartisan organization mm -hmm. based in London, promoting activities to understand Asia and the Middle East better, and acts as a hub for engaging with the, with the region's art, culture, and politics. We engage through research and dialogue to facilitate a better understanding of these regions from a socio-economic and political viewpoint. Recently, we've undertaken several lecture series on terrorism, colonialism, Ottoman Empire, and civilization studies. We hope through these lectures, we shall be able to have a better understanding of the people, culture, and politics of Asia and the Middle East. Now a bit about the Usul Academy. Usul Academy is an online higher education institution established in 2021 with the aim to deliver classical Islamic studies and contemporary subjects through an innovative and flexible approach for students across the globe. Usul Academy currently offers a dis distinguished on Distinguished Honours Program in Contemporary Comparative Islamic Studies, BA, in which students study Islamic, study academic Arabic, classical Islamic studies, as well as social sciences from a comparative perspective. The aim of the academy is to equip students for a professional career by providing instrumental knowledge anchored in the modern and postmodern paradigms. It also wants to elevate the purpose of knowledge and roots uh, and with students in the Islamic tradition to help them face the challenges of modern life, more details can be found at usul.academy. Tonight's lecture is Decolonizing Social Science, a critical and comparative introduction to theories and methods. The lecture is by Professor Recep, Recep Senturk. Sorry, I think I, I hope I um, pronounced your name correctly. Yes, yes, correct. <laughs> who is a very distinguished scholar in this field. Professor Recep Center is professor of sociology at Ibn, Ibn Haldun University. He served as the founding president of Ibn Haldun University from 2017 to 2021. He was a researcher at the Center for Islamic Studies in Istanbul and founding director of the Alliance of Civilizations Institute. He is the head of the International Ibn Haldun Society he published widely in English, Arabic, and Turkish on a whole range of topics, including social theory and methods, civilization, modernization, sociology of religion, networks of Hadith transmission, Malcolm X, Islam, and human rights, modern Turkish thought, and Ibn Khaldun. He also authored a number of books that have been translated to a number of languages, including Arabic, Japanese, and Spanish. That is a brief about tonight's lecture. We start with the introduction, which we have just done. Next, we'll go straight to the lecture, which will last around 30 to 45 minutes. The lecture will then be followed by the comments and QA section, which will last around 30, another 30 minutes. We ask our audience to do a number of things to help make this a productive session for us, inshallah. Keep your mic and mobile muted until told otherwise. We encourage discussion and debate, maintaining a professional and cordial approach. We also encourage attendees to take notes on the le lecture for the comments and QA section. Now, with, without further ado, I'd like to ask Professor Rez Recep Sentur to deliver the lecture, please. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for this uh, introduction. Uh, as uh, you have mentioned, uh, uh, I was asked uh, to give a series of uh, lectures about uh, decolonizing social sciences from uniplexity to uh, multiplexity. So this is the first one. 
Uh, and uh, in this lecture, I will uh, lay the ground uh, for the uh, upcoming uh, lectures uh, as well. Uh, uh, so uh, our purpose is to uh, develop a critical and comparative perspective uh, in the audience to the uh, social theories and social uh, methods. Uh, uh, usually, uh, when people talk about uh, social theories and methods, they present only one theory and one uh, method they believe in. But here, uh, we will have a critical and comparative uh, perspective. And uh, even in the um, uh, classes and lectures, uh, aimed at uh, comparison, they usually make a comparison between two uh, Western uh, social theories. But here we will make a global uh, comparison. We will compare theories in the Western uh, civilization and also uh, emanating from Islamic civilization. So this way it will be truly uh, comparative. Uh, not uh, 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 limited only with the Western uh, theories, uh, all right? So uh, in this uh, series, uh, uh, first we'll talk about the critical and comparative introduction to theories and methods. In the second talk, we will be uh, 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 talking about rethinking social science beyond the canon. And the third talk will be about multiplexity as a social research paradigm. The fourth talk will be about what's Nazar. And Nazar is a word in uh, Arabic. It means theoretical reasoning. Uh, so we will be talking about pure reasoning and religious reasoning. And these are the two types of theoretical thinking in Islamic uh, thought. Uh, then we will talk about multiplex human ontology. Uh, and I'll try to demonstrate that uh, uh, human beings uh, is uh, the, the existence of a human being is constituted by uh, body, mind, and soul. So there are three components or three levels uh, uh, for human uh, ontology, for human uh, existence, uh, because this is very important for uh, social sciences because social sciences are about the human beings and their actions. So what kind of uh, concept of human being uh, underlie uh, the Islamic uh, social thought? And we will do this uh, in comparison with the uh, concept of human being in uh, positivist and idealist social theories uh, in the West. Uh, and then we will talk about uh, human action uh, similar to uh, the concept of human, the concept of action is also very important, the key uh, concept in uh, social sciences, because all social sciences are about uh, human action. So what's human action and how Fuqa sees human action and how Tasawu sees human action and how they complement each other. Uh, the discipline of Fuqa uh, focuses on the external or the visible uh, level of human action, while Tasawwuf uh, studies the inner dimension of uh, human uh, action. So this is what I will try to demonstrate in this uh, talk. Uh, and, uh, and at the end, I will be talking about multiplex uh, ethics and human rights, uh, because uh, the ultimate outcome of uh, social sciences is to regulate uh, human uh, social uh, relations. And uh, this leads us to uh, ethics and rights, uh, all right? So today we will be uh, making a general introduction to uh, theories and uh, methods and how we will uh, compare them. But uh, first, let's ask, what's a theory? A theory is like a body in that it's a, uh, uh, it is a composition of parts. So there are parts in the theory they all get together and make the uh, system. So the starting point of a theory is either a certain fact about an external reality or an idea about a mental reality. So we start with a fact, uh, then we have an idea about it, and we think about that. And this thinking leads us to creative thinking uh, to produce a new idea. 
And when we test this idea, then we end up with a theory. So th these are the uh, building blocks or steps towards a theory. Uh, so we said that uh, the first step is a fact, uh, an idea, uh, uh, you know, the, the first building block of a theory. So what's a fact? A fact is something that can be expressed with a statement, which can be proven true or false. Uh, for instance, uh, statistically, women live longer than men. Two plus two is equal to five. The moon is the satellite of the earth. So these are facts. And uh, when you start building a theory, you need to start with a fact. And usually you need a, you need a fact that's not uh, uh, commonly noticed by uh, people, a fact that, uh, that's neglected or not taken, for, uh, not taken uh, seriously. So this would be like the first building block of a theory. Uh, then we said that uh, from a fact, you move to an idea. So what's an idea? Uh, an idea is a proposed connection between facts or concepts. Uh, and, it's represented, and its representation reached in the mind. So this is what we call uh, an idea. So in our mind, we bring together facts and we say there is a particular relationship between these facts. This is an idea or we have concepts in our mind, and then we establish a relationship you know, between these uh, concepts. Uh, so uh, this is called uh, an idea. But if this relationship is a new relationship, you have just discovered, this is called creative thinking, this new idea, a novel uh, idea. Uh, a simple idea is often used to mean a concept, but as it gets more complex, it then refers to a judgment or an argument. And an idea then becomes a proposed connection between facts or uh, concepts. Uh, uh, so uh, for instance, a person's health improves during the times when they drink green tea only. Another example, justice is fairness. Another example, a scientific theory can be falsified. You know, you see here, there are two parts uh, and then uh, the, the speaker is proposing a connection between the two parts, which may be proven true or wrong. Uh, so this is what we call an idea. So how about thinking? You know, uh, we all uh, consider ourselves as, uh, you know, thinking people and a human being is defined as a thinking animal, right? Uh, so thinking is an activity of the human mind, exploring connections among facts or concepts. So this is what we call thinking, basically trying to come up with an idea. Uh, uh, so the process of moving from facts or concepts to arguments is thinking, which is basically is exploring new connections among facts. Uh, so we are, however, more interested in creative thinking which is discovering new connections between facts and concepts uh, that have not uh, yet been noticed by uh, other people. Uh, so uh, if you discover a new connection between two concepts or between two facts, then this would be uh, considered you know, a creative thinking. Uh, Uh, so the ultimate goal uh, is uh, uh, coming up with a theory, uh, you know, moving from a fact to an idea uh, to uh, creative thinking. Then the ultimate goal is to come up with a theory. So what's a theory? A theory is a set of uh, ideas put together in a systematic manner concerning a thing or an entity or a subject. Uh, 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 it's, uh, it's a unified systematic causal explanation of a diverse range of social phenomena. For instance, we say the theory of gravity explains why things fall. So, so this is a theory. So there is a theory of gravity and the, the benefit or the purpose of the theory 
to explain why things fall. Uh, social conflict theory explains why we have conflicts between nations, classes, and groups, uh, similar to the theory of uh, gravity in social sciences. You know, uh, we have uh, conflicts, uh, and we want to like explain why conflicts uh, occur uh, in uh, society. And the purpose of social theories is to explain why people do what they are doing. That's the whole purpose. That's the ultimate purpose. Why people do what they are doing. So if you come up with a causal explanation or interpretation about why people do what they are doing, this is a theory. Uh, or Actually, it would be called more specifically a social uh, theory. And uh, people you know, from the beginning of history have been trying to answer this question, why people do what they are uh, doing, all right? So why do we need theories? Why should we care about uh, theories? Uh, uh, theories are explanatory tools that help us understand uh, and order phenomena, because when you understand why things happen, then you can better regulate it. You can better uh, control it. You can better uh, organize it. Uh, but if you don't know why things happen the way uh, they do, uh, then you cannot control, you cannot organize, you cannot regulate. Uh, so this is the reason why we need uh, theories. Uh, when we come across a phenomena, uh, whether in nature or in society, we try to understand the nature of the phenomenon and the causes behind it. Uh, after some research and observation, moreover, using other such type thing methods, we reach certain conclusions uh, about the nature of that phenomena and the causes uh, behind it. Uh, then we try to express our conclusion in a formula that's relevant to the area of study. This explanation is called theory which is expected to explain that uh, phenomenon. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, there are so many different theories about the same subject. This is true in uh, natural sciences as well as in social sciences. I mean, you may think these are all great scholars. They are very intelligent, well-educated people, and they should have the same idea about the same issue. Uh, but in reality, this is not so. I mean, all these scholars, you know, they have different ideas, different theories about the same subject. Why? You know, uh, how can we make sense of like why uh, all these great minds have different theories about the same subject or about the same uh, phenomena? So the origin of differences between theories for the same issue lies in the differences in interconnected ontology, epistemology, and methodology. Uh, so uh, these are the foundations of social theories. So if people have different uh, ontology, different epistemology, and different methodology, they will eventually end up producing different theories. Uh, so theories uh, is comparable to the tip of the iceberg, uh, the visible part of it. But, uh, uh, but in the background, uh, there are implicit assumptions, and these assumptions are usually not disclosed to the readers, to the audience. They are about ontology, epistemology, and methodology. So these are the implicit foundations uh, or implicit latent uh, philosophical underpinnings of theories. Uh, but usually, th uh, when theories are presented, you know, uh, the authors don't talk about their ontology, epistemology, and methodology. They keep it secret. They keep it in the background. They keep it uh, hidden. Uh, and uh, here in this uh, introductory talk, I will uh, draw your attention to this implicit uh, background so that uh, you can better understand the structure of the uh, theories. And when you uh, want to critically understand it, you can do it in a better way. And uh, uh, also, when you want to compare it, you don't compare only what's at the surface level, but also you can compare uh, what's uh, hidden, implicit, and uh, latent. Uh,
Uh, so theories and methods, these are publicly uh, presented, but uh, ontology, methodology, and methodology, uh, these are taken for granted and they are usually not publicly uh, presented, uh, but they uh, constitute the foundations of the theories. Uh, so uh, what are the major questions that precede theory building? Uh, so the first question, uh, anybody uh, who's uh, trying to develop an idea or a theory is, uh, what is the subject I am thinking about? What is the subject I am researching about? What exists? So like if I'm uh, studying a society, I have to ask, what is society? If I'm studying like human beings, I have to ask, what's a human being? You know, uh, if I'm studying human action, what's action? You know, these are ontological questions about what exists, what is there, what's reality, you know? Uh, then the second question, which is the epistemological question, how can I know? How can I know that? Okay, so first let's say I answer the question, what is society? What's a human being? What's human action? What's economy? What's state? After I uh, answered the ontological question, then the next question, can I know society? Is society intelligible? You know, is, is it possible to understand society? You know, uh, and how can I uh, do this? Uh, so that's the epistemological uh, question. Then the methodological question, how can we build a model of causal explanation or, or interpretation and then regulate things, order things, control things? So what's the way for it? Uh, so that's the methodological uh, question. But these uh, three questions, they precede any effort for theory building. That's why uh, your answers to what exists and how can I know it and how can I build a model of explanation, these are called your pre-commitments. Your pre-commitments before you come up with a, a theory. Uh, and, uh, and, and if you are trying to develop a theory, you must be aware of your pre-commitments and also, if a theory is presented to you, uh, the first question you should ask if you want to critically analyze this theory, what are the pre-commitments of that author? You know, what he thinks about existence, what he thinks about human knowledge, about reality, and uh, what's his model of explanation? So uh, you have to ask these three questions, uh, the three, uh, uh, fundamental uh, and underlying uh, uh, aspects of any uh, theory. And these are called, as I said, pre-commitments. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, as I have mentioned, there are many theories, you know, uh, in sociology, in psychology, in natural sciences, in philosophy, there are many uh, theories. Uh, and uh, uh, how can we classify those theories so that we can compare them? Uh, usually, uh, people uh, classify theories, modern theories and postmodern theories, conflict theories or you know, uh, theories of uh, solidarity. Uh, I came up with a different uh, classification method based on the, uh, based on the way uh, theories approach reality, whether they accept that, you know, there is a, you know, single level of existence, single level of reality, or there are multiple levels of reality. Uh, so I call uh, the single layered worldview uh, and discourse to explain reality a uniplex uh, worldview. Uh, a uniplex approach, a uniplex discourse. Uniplex means unilayered, you know, uh, uh, single layered uh, understanding of reality. And then uh, 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 I call theories that have a comprehensive approach uh, uh, and recognize that there are multiple layers of reality, 
reality is multi-layered, I call the multiplex worldview. You know, uh, uh, and multiplex means multi-layered. You know, a, a, a worldview that accepts that there are multiple levels of reality and multiple levels of uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, so what's the advantage of adopting a uniplex worldview uh, in, uh, uh, in theory building? So any uniplex worldview uh, is easy to learn and easy to apply. Because let's say you are materialist, you try to reduce everything to material level. So it's easy, you know, uh, but uh, what's the limitation? Uh, the, the limitation, it, it does injustice to multi-layered reality. I mean, this kind of reductionism is not going to help us understand the sophisticated nature of reality. Uh, but on the other hand, what's the advantage of adopting a multiplex worldview, a multiplex theoretical perspective? So it does justice to the complex reality, to the sophisticated reality, but it is not easy you know, to understand it, to learn it, and implement it in your thinking and research. So let's uh, briefly talk about these uh, uh, underlying uh, foundations of uh, theory building. So like, let's talk a little bit about ontology, epistemology, and methodology. What's ontology? It's a big word, I understand. <laughs> you know, uh, ontology is a branch of philosophy that studies existence, you know, uh, from the point of view that everything is a being. So it's a science of studying beings, you know. Uh, uh, ontology tries to provide systematic answers to the following questions. What's the ultimate nature of reality? Is it possible to discover the true nature of reality? If yes, what is it like? You know, what are the categories of beings and their relations? You know, uh, so, uh, uh, so the, uh, these are the major questions ontology uh, uh, tries to address. And your answers to these questions determine your ontological position, which is your attitude towards existence. You know, uh, like each thinker, each scholar has an attitude towards existence, you know, towards the reality in which we live. But at the same time, we are part of that reality uh, as well. Uh, so uh, that's the uh, first step uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, understanding the world we live in. All right? Uh, However, there are so many different ontological uh, theories and they contradict with each other and they oppose to each other. Why? Uh, 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 so this could be uh, uh, illustrated by a story uh, from Rumi's Mehnevi. Mevlana Jatun Rumi in his Mehnevi, he talks about a story of the elephant in a dark room. Uh, so, you know, uh, in India, uh, people brought one elephant, they put the elephant in a dark room and brought in people. Uh, they allowed them to touch different parts of the elephant. And then they asked them, uh, what's an elephant? So, you know, the one who touched the trunk, he said, elephant is like a pipe. You know, the one who typed on the, you know, uh, uh, skin, he said, elephant is like carpet, plain. You know, the one who touched the leg, he said, elephant is like a pillar. So, you know, different people, you know, uh, uh, were touching different parts of the elephant and describing elephant uh, the way they, uh, uh, they uh, felt. Uh, uh, so similar to this, you know, uh, some thinkers, some philosophers, some academics, focus only on the material aspect of existence, uh, while some others focus only on the non-material, non-physical, non-tangible aspects of existence. And some others, they adopt a holistic perspective 
and they recognize both material and non-material aspects of uh, existence. So you see there are different you know, uh, approaches in uh, ontology trying to uh, uh, address the question of what exists. So some people say what exists is only the material uh, objects, and uh, some say no, what exists is the non-material uh, you know, beings, while others, they say both material and non-material beings, they both exist uh, together uh, from a multiplex uh, perspective, all right? Uh, so when we uh, look at the ontological traditions in the world, we see uh, three major uh, traditions. The positivist, materialist uh, understanding of uh, existence and the idealist understanding of existence and the multiplex understanding of existence but we, it's possible for us to uh, put positivism and idealism you know the materialist and the idealist perspectives into one category because they share one uh, feature together they are both reductionist and uh, they are both uniplex because uh, the positivist the materialist they try to reduce everything to the material reality while idealists, they try to reduce everything to the ideal reality, non-material reality. So their understanding of existence is unilayered, single layered. So, so that's why uh, I call them uniplex uh, ontology. Uh, but uh, the multiplex uh, ontology uh, perspective accepts that there are multiple levels of existence. There is a material level of existence as well as a non-material level of uh, existence. Uh, so this uh, leads us to a comparison between uniplex uh, perspective on ontology with its two uh, versions, the positivist version and the idealist version, and then the multiplex uh, ontology, uh, which is uh, more, uh, which is uh, uh, holistic and uh, comprehensive. So according to materialist ontology, existence is unilayered. Uh, all that exists consists solely of matter or different states of matter, and that what we perceive through our senses is all of reality. Everything in the world, including thinking, freedom, love, and states of consciousness, can only be explained in terms of material processes. So they say these are reflections of the material processes. They have no reality in themselves. You know, they, they depend on material uh, processes. Uh, so materialist ontology also argues that reality is objective. It is independent of our minds and it can be explained through causal relations. Uh, and they also argue that uh, such cause and effect relations demonstrate that there are certain laws behind natural and social phenomena, which science should aim to uncover. Uh, of course, there is a, a great uh, detail you know, about every sentence here, but because we have short time, I cannot go into details uh, of everything here. So the idealist ontology also argues that you know, existence is unilayered. Uh, the ultimate nature of reality is incorporeal, immaterial, intangible, and mental rather than material. So the mental reality, uh, the metaphysical reality, the ideal reality uh, is the prime uh, reality. It is uh, the forms of things, the ideas in our minds that are real, but not the matter itself. So things as we perceive them are forever changing. Such a world cannot be real, but can only be illusory. The forms of things, unlike the things themselves, are unchanging and intelligible. So we should focus on that. This is what they uh, argue. Reality is ontologically subjective, mind-dependent, and mentally constructed. See, just the opposite of the positivist materialist uh, arguments. So the poesis, they say reality is objective, 
you know, uh, the idealist, they say, no, reality is subjective. So uh, the materialist, they say, reality is independent of our mind. The idealist, they say, no, reality is mind dependent. And, uh, and they also argue that man, reality is constructed by uh, human beings. Uh, so external reality is subjugated to our mind. So that's the idealist uh, ontological perspective. Uh, so they also argue that the reality can be known through our reason rather than our senses that frequently mislead us. And it can be understood through interpretive rather than causal relations. So the idealists, they focus on interpret interpretive relations, not causal relations. They say causal relations exist in nature, uh, but we cannot uh, use uh, uh, discovering causal relations in society. We have to understand what's happening in uh, society. So you see uh, two different perspectives, but what they share in common is that they are unilayered. Uh, perspectives, trying to reduce everything to a single uh, level of reality, all right? Uh, but from a multiplex ontological uh, perspective, existence is multi-layered. So there is material level, there is non-material level, and there is divine level. So in Arabic, there is mulk, malakut, and lahut. Uh, and there are other terms used for it. For the material level, it's called alam shahada the visible world, and the for non-material level of existence, uh, the malakut is called alam rughay, because it's invisible. But there is also lahut, the uh, level of God's existence. You know, uh, so mulk, malakut, lahut. So this is different than uh, dual uh, ontology, which divides the world into physical world and metaphysical world. You know, it, from this perspective, God is separated uh, from the metaphysical world uh, because God is the creator uh, and creator cannot be put in the same category with the creators, cr created beings. You know, uh, God is different than angels or the concepts uh, or other things that are not visible to us because he is their uh, creator. So that's why he should be uh, uh, treated in this in a separate way. Uh, category as a separate level of uh, existence. Uh, so there is uh, one reality, but it has multiple levels. This may be called unity in multiplexity. So they are, they are all interconnected with each other. They're not separated from each other, uh, but there are multiple uh, levels. Uh, not only the causal relations, but also the interpretive and semantic relations are used to explain and understand reality. So it's not reductionist. I mean, in the material world, you can use a causal explanation. And in the non-material world, you know, you can use uh, interpretive uh, relations. Uh, uh, and uh, there are both objective and subjective realities. A materialist, they focus only on objective reality. Idealists focus only on subjective uh, reality. But the multiplex perspective uh, uh, accepts that you know, there is objective reality and subjective reality. You know, uh, why uh, try to reduce to a single uh, dimension? Uh, it's better to uh, analyze all of them together. As you see that the multiplex perspective is not an eclectic uh, perspective. So it comes up with a new uh, ontology, new epistemology that uh, takes us away. Uh, from the false dichotomy uh, created by uh, multi, uh, by materialist and idealist division. Uh, so from a multiplex ontology perspective, the division between materialist and idealist, it's a false dichotomy. It's a false dilemma. You know, uh, we should go away from it by adopting a multiplex uh, perspective. All right. <clears throat> uh, so uh, uh, another type of uh, classification of existence from a multiplex perspective by Al-Ghazali and also Tashkop Zadeh, uh, the great Ottoman uh, scholar, is as follows. So material existence in the external world uh, and then conceptual existence in the mind and linguistic existence in speech and existence in writing. 
So this is how Ghazali and Tashkur Rezade classified uh, existence. Uh, uh, all right. So what's epistemology? Now let's talk a little bit about uh, epistemology. Uh, epistemology mean, epistem means uh, knowledge, and epistemology is a branch of uh, philosophy which is concerned with the nature and scope of our knowledge. How, how come we know things? You know, or how we come to know things? You know, uh, uh, so it is with the following four fundamental questions. What is knowing? What are the means of knowing? How does knowing take place? What kinds of knowledge are legitimate, acceptable, valid? Uh, so again, uh, uh, the ontological positions with respect to existence uh, have their own positions in epistemology as well. The positivist epistemological tradition, idealist epistemological tradition, and the multiplex epistemological tradition. Because your uh, attitude or your approach in ontology determines your epistemology. You know, uh, uh, the way you answer what exists determines how can we know the existence. Uh, so the uh, uh, so these are three positions, but again, uh, because positivist and idealist uh, uh, approaches to epistemology are reductionists, you know they accept only single type of knowledge. We group them as uniplex epistemology, uh, but the multiplex uh, epistemology, you know, is separate from it because it accepts that there are multiple levels of knowledge. The positivist epistemology argues that uh, 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 that uh, uh, that uh, knowledge uh, only or primarily can come from the senses. So the uh, the only uh, or the primary source of knowledge is sense perception. So that's the most fundamental argument of the positivist epistemology, uh, and it's based on the ontological assumption that reality is out there. You know whether humans think about it or not. Uh, so there is a reality outside of human mind, independent of human mind. Reality is both ontologically and epistemologically objective. Uh, so they emphasize objectivity. Observation and experiments are the ways through which understanding begins. And only through empirical confirmation, certainty may ultimately be achieved. Uh, so Experimentation and observation, these are the most important keywords uh, in positive, uh, positivist epistemology. Reasoning, on the other hand, is dependent on empirical knowledge. Reason, therefore, plays only a secondary role in interpreting the knowledge we gain through senses. So, uh, because they think our minds may mislead us, but our senses, sense perception, uh, gives us certain knowledge about the reality. On the, uh, in in contradistinction, idealist epistemology uh, argues that uh, if reliable knowledge only comes from the senses, which provides us with visible information, and empiricists argue, then how can the knowledge of the ever-changing appearances of things be certain? Uh, so, because uh, you know, our sense perception is about uh, ever-changing uh, outside world, but uh, how can we have like a stable and certain uh, and permanent understanding of such an ever-changing world through sense perception? This is the idealist uh, uh, argument. Uh, so, idealist epistemology or rationalism is the theory of knowledge asserting that all knowledge comes not from sense perception but from reason you know uh, because they say that uh, you know our senses may mislead us you know sense perception may deceive us but reason gives us certain knowledge the opposite of the ideal uh, positivist uh, epistemology uh, so idealist epistemology uses rational insight rather than sensory experience all knowledge is eventually grounded upon reason, since perception may mislead us. So that's their uh, argument. Uh, the rationalists believe uh, 
rationalist beliefs we come to know uh, we come to knowledge a priori uh, 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 through the use of logic and thus independently of sensory experience so they argue that independent of sensory experience we have some a priori knowledge you know the, in our minds uh, uh, and logic explores this a priori you know uh, knowledge uh, uh, all right uh, how about uh, the multiplex epistemology uh, multiplex epistemology is a translation of an ancient arabic concept is meratibul ilm you know meratibul ilm you know martabe martabe means level meratib is the plural of martabe you know meratibul ilm you know uh, levels of uh, knowledge so the multiplex epistemology opposes the positivist and idealist epistemology in that they reduce knowledge and source of knowledge to a particular level uh, so uh, multiplex epistemology argues that no you cannot reduce knowledge to a particular level there are many levels of uh, knowledge uh, so each level of existence requires a different way of knowing you know uh, so multiplex epistemology was the dominant epistemological perspective among scholars until the modern times when a uniplex materialist monist science culture became prevalent scholars from different parts of the world be them muslims christians jews hindus or else maintain that there are multiple types and sources of knowledge uh, so it was common to the whole world but with the rise of uh, modern uh, science you know uh, uh, the materialist uh, or the uniplex uh, perspective became uh, dominant and the idealist perspective emerged in reaction uh, to it uh, uh, so uh, uh, from the multiplex uh, epistemological perspective Maratibul ilim as follows. So there is uh, uh, sense perception, there is reason, and there is divine revelation. So these three are three sources of knowledge. Sense perception is called in Arabic al hawas al salima. Reason is al akal, and revelation al khabar al sadiq. Uh, these are objective sources of knowledge that are used in public public domain. But then there are subjective source of knowledge as well, like dreams, you know, like in the Quran and in the Hadith, there are many instances where uh, dreams are used as source of knowledge, but it's subjective. You cannot make an argument based on your dream in the public domain. It's for you only. Uh, same way, hadz, same way, ilham, the inspiration you know, in your heart uh, or kashf you know, opening of the uh, eye of the heart. But these are all uh, private, uh, subjective uh, sources of knowledge. Uh, you cannot make a public argument based on uh, these sources of uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, however, reason, sense perception, revelation, you know, uh, these are objective sources of knowledge you can make an argument based on this source of knowledge in public you know uh, all right uh, so from the uh, perspective of multiplex ontology i mean multiplex uh, uh, epistemology uh, there are different types of knowledge hissiyat akliyat nakliyat and keshfiyat so uh, hissiyat knowledge we gain through sense perception this is empirical knowledge and then akliyat rational knowledge nakliyat reported knowledge like the quran and hadith you know knowledge that's reported to us uh, and then uh, spiritual knowledge keshfiyat you know uh, so uh, these uh, different types of knowledge they complement each other they are not mutually exclusive alternatives of each other i mean uh, a Muslim scholar uh, may use uh, empirical knowledge. He may also use rational knowledge. He may also use reported knowledge, and he may also use spiritual knowledge. And all of them, it's you know, uh, so they are not uh, mutually exclusive. But uh, in the West, you know, either you use empirical knowledge or rational knowledge. Either you are positivist or idealist. You know. Uh, they suffer from false dualities. Uh, 
uh, and pseudo dichotomies. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, these no these different types of knowledge in maratibul ilm they have different usages. So uh, empirical knowledge is objective and binding. Rational knowledge is objective and binding. Reported knowledge, you know, uh, uh, from the Quran and the Sunnah, if they are true, sound, they are also objective and binding. But spiritual knowledge, you know, like uh, gained through dreams or kashf or ilham, it is subjective and not binding. Uh, it may be binding only to yourself. And there's also condition that it should not contradict with hissiyat, akliyat, and nakliyat. You know, uh, so there are uh, constraints uh, and guide guidelines how it should be used. Uh, again, uh, there is another way uh, knowledge is uh, classified uh, from the multiplex uh, uh, perspective. Uh, uh, so there are different levels of certainty. This is called maratibul yakin. Maratibul yakin. Uh, so first. Uh, you know, uh, there is 100% certain knowledge. This is called yakin. And then uh, if uh, a knowledge is not 100% certain, this is called zan, the presumption or conjecture. Uh, and then shek, if it's less than 50% certain, then it's called shek. And then if it has no evidence, if it's groundless suspicion, it's called vehm, superstition. You know? uh, so... Uh, depending on the uh, uh, level of certainty of knowledge, knowledge is classified into different uh, groups. I mean, you can use certain knowledge, but you can also use zan. You know, if something is certain about like fifty percent, I mean, it's okay. You know, you may uh, rely on that type of knowledge in some issues if there is no other uh, better way. Uh, but uh, you are not supposed to use shek or vehm. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it is accepted that there are levels of uh, certain knowledge. So there is a certainty by knowledge, certainty by witnessing, certainty by experiencing. So certainty by knowledge is called ilm al yakin. Certainty by witnessing is called ayn al yakin. Certainty by experiencing is called haq al yakin. So let's say you know you heard that there is Istanbul. You know, and you read from the books, there is Istanbul. So this gave you certainty by knowledge that there is such a city. You know, uh, then you came with airplane and you flew you know, over Istanbul. You know, you saw Istanbul. You know that this is certainty by witnessing. Then you landed in Istanbul. You know, uh, you checked in in a hotel and you walked in the streets of Istanbul. This is certainty by experiencing, haqq al uh, Or another example, like you heard about sea. You know, let's say you are born in a place where there is no sea, but you heard that you know, there is sea in the world. Uh, this is certainty by knowledge. Then you came and uh, saw the sea. This is certainty by witnessing. Then you jumped in the sea and you uh, swim in the sea. Then this is certainty by uh, experiencing. So you see that there are different levels of knowledge. This is what we call maratibul ilm, uh, levels of uh, knowledge. All right. Uh, so now let's talk about uh, methodology, different uh, uh, methods, you know, used in different uh, disciplines. So methodology is the study of methods applied to an area of study. It, it identifies the methods to be used in a research. Method denotes a procedure, tool, or technique used by the inquirer to generate and analyze data within a particular field of study. So methodology studies methods. Methodology is the name of the discipline. Uh, uh, method is the tool. You know, uh, so as a tool, method contributes to the generation of knowledge, but is itself considered to be transparent or uh, natural. Uh, so, uh, using a method makes knowledge valid or authoritative or binding. You know, uh, if knowledge is produced without any method, people don't respect it, you know, uh, don't accept it as a valid uh, knowledge. Uh, 
So uh, the uh, major different methodological approaches, the Poistis methodology, interpreted methodology, and multiplex methodology. As I said, uh, you know, uh, ontology leads to epistemology. Your ontological position determines your epistemological position, and your epistemological position determines your methodological position. Uh, so uh, the Poistis methodology argues that social reality does not change depending on the culture or time, it's universal. There is a social reality that's universal and it waits out there to be discovered independently on human, independent of human subjectivity. Uh, so, uh, you know, like, uh, social reality is no different than social reality. I mean, uh, all sciences share the same method nature and society can be explained through the same universal method. No difference. Whether you study economy or politics or psychology or physics or chemistry, biology, you use the same method. That's the positivist uh, argument. Uh, so positivist methodology aims to uncover the universal laws of human action and social phenomena across various settings and contexts. These laws can be discovered by the collection of objective facts about the social world in a statistical form. Uh, by the careful analysis of these facts and by repeated examination of the findings. Typically, Poistis methods operationalize variables as quantitative data. That's by translating a social phenomenon into quantifiable or numerically measurable uh, variable. It uses methods of questionnaires, surveys, experiments, and measurements. Uh, the core of the scientific method of the Poistis methodology is first to form questions or hypotheses, and then to obtain knowledge through observations and experiments to either support or disprove a theory. So the Poistis methodology is characterized by the hypothetical deductive method. Uh, often referred to as the scientific method. So today, what we call scientific method is technically, philosophically called hypothetical deductive method. Uh, so it means that, uh, you know, uh, you start with a hypothesis and you use deduction to test this hypothesis. You know, uh, if it's proven or supported by the data you collected, you know, uh, your uh, hypothesis uh, is accepted as a theory. If the data you collected disproves, falsifies your uh, theory, you know, it is uh, uh, rejected. And then you have to come up with a new uh, theory. All right. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, yeah, your observation or experiments either support your hypothesis or uh, disprove your uh, hypothesis. So if uh, your observation and experimentation supports your hypothesis, then you produce a causal explanation. You know, uh, otherwise you say, oh, this correlation, this just accident that two things you know, existed together and there is no causal relationship uh, between the two. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, these things have like lots of uh, detail, but uh, for the sake of time, we have to go fast. Uh, so the interpretive uh, methodology uh, has some striking, strikingly different arguments. Uh, according to interpretive methodology, social reality is created by the intentional actions of social actors. So social reality is our creation. It's not like nature. It's not out there. You know, we create social reality. This is the idealist argument. We construct it. You know, and and social reality is in a constant change, depending on the culture and time. It's not like natural laws. And it cannot be generalized and predicted, but can only be interpreted. You see how different, you know, from the positivist uh, uh, methodology. Uh, so interpretivists view social reality as being embedded within. Uh, they interpreted the reality.
through a sense making process rather than a hypothesis testing process. Okay, uh, so this is very different than the uh, hypothetical deductive post uh, methodology. So the methods to study society should be interpretive, unlike the methods applied in the natural sciences. Since there are no universal laws and no causal relationships between social events and phenomena. So they are like uh, completely rejecting the most basic assumptions of the positivist uh, perspective. Uh, uh, as, as we have discussed, they argue that the social world is completely different than the natural world. So you cannot use the same methods in uh, studying uh, social and cultural world. Uh, so the purpose of the research involving interpretive methods is to understand how people conceive, experience, interpret, and construct the social world. I mean, the purpose of social research is not to explain or discover causal laws behind it. You see completely different research uh, agenda, all right? Uh, so these two uh, may be uh, compared uh, in, a, in a summary. So the inductive uh, methodology starts with observation, uh, just trying to discover patterns and then come with hypothesis and theory. So this is the idealist uh, perspective, uh, but the deductive methodology starts with theory, hypothesis, pattern, and observation, basically starting with the hypothesis and testing it, uh, uh, whether the uh, data supports it uh, or uh, not. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, so the post is methodology intended for theory or hypothesis testing, the researchers start with a theory and then test the theoretical postulates by using empirical data. The reality is relatively independent of the context, can be abstracted from their context and studied through objective techniques, such as standardized measures, quantitative data, and context-free research. But according to interpretive methodology, uh, it is intended for theory building. The researcher starts with the data not with the theory, not with the hypothesis, and tries to drive a theory about the phenomenon of interest from the observed data. So it is inductive. Social reality is embedded within a human being, you know, uh, so within our mind, you know, uh, and cannot be abstracted from social settings. It should be interpreted through a sense-making process. That's why they rely on qualitative data and context-bound research, like interviews, you know, talking to people. You know, uh, uh, so how about the multiplex methodology? But from the multiplex uh, methodology, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, like uh, multiplex ontology leads us to multiplex epistemology, and multiplex epistemology leads us to uh, multiplex uh, methodology. Uh, in Arabic, maratibul wujud, leads us to maratib ulum and maratib ulum leads us to maratib usul so this is how muslim scholars formulated it uh, okay uh, so uh, there are three major methods uh, under maratib usul uh, so pure reasoning based on rational and empirical methods and religious reasoning based on rational and empirical methods plus uh, interpretation of the Hadith and Quran, Wahy, you know, uh, uh, and then purification of the self, Tasfiyah or Tezkiyah. So there are three methods uh, used to reach to truth. Uh, 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 so there is uh, uh, objective and rational methods, uh, reasoning, and it's called Nazar. Nazar means reasoning, theoretical reasoning, and Nazariya is theory in Arabic. Uh, so Nazar has two types, pure reasoning, Nazar Akli, is called Nazar Akli, uh, and it's used in philosophical inquiry and empirical inquiry, like all natural sciences, you know, philosophy, logic, you know, uh, mathematics, they all use pure reason. 
That means why is not included in research, in theoretical thinking. So that's the common ground between us and other civilizations, other cultures, other religions, you know, uh, and the disciplines that are based on pure uh, reasoning, they are called ulum mushtarake. Ulum mushtarake or ulum dakhile. These are sciences that are common between us and non-Muslims, uh, all right? And then there is religious reasoning, nazar shari. It is used by fiqh and kalam. Uh, so nazar shari includes uh, reason, includes sense perception, plus wahi. So uh, these are objective and rational uh, methods. Uh, 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 but at the same time, there is a subjective and a rational method, which is teske and tasfiye. It's uh, based on the purification of the self. It's used by uh, tasawwuf. Uh, so let me uh, cite two great scholars from uh, you know, our uh, intellectual history. Uh, one is Fahretin and Razi uh, on Nazar and Tasfiye. He said, Fi anna tahsil hadil ma'arif al muqaddasa hal at tariku ilayhi wahid am akthar min wahid. Basically, he is asking, is there one scientific method or there are more than one multiple methods in sciences? So he says that the ilam annahu qadin keshafa li arbab al basair anna tariqa ilahi min wachain. Ahaduma tariqu ashab al nazar wal istiklal, al thani tariqu ashab al riyadah wal mujahada. So he's saying that the, you know, there are two major methods. One method, tariqu ashab al nazar wal istiklal, you know, uh, it is the uh, method of the uh, rational uh, thinkers. Uh, based on demonstration, you know, proving something through empirical or rational evidence. And the other, Tariqa Ashab Riyada Wal Mujahada, the method of the people who uh, purify uh, themselves through self disciplining and inner uh, struggle. So, two methods, you know, one is rational uh, methodology, objective methodology, and the other, spiritual methodology. And Tashko Prasada, uh, he uh, is also like uh, Fahrettin Razi. Of course, uh, uh, many uh, other scholars, you know, almost all scholars accept the same thing, but I'm just giving you uh, two uh, citations uh, only. So, uh, uh, Tashko Prezade said, these are two approaches. The first approach is referred to as theoretical reasoning, Nazar, or inference, Istidlal. And the second is referred as purification of the self, tasfiyah, or spiritual enlightenment, mushahada. The first is the level of well-grounded scholars, and the second is the level of men of truth and sincerity, as siddiqin. Each of the two approaches culminates in the other, and he who masters both is referred to as majma' al-Bahrain. You know, so this sentence is very important. Each of the two approaches, whether Nazar approach or the Tasfi approach, at the end culminate in each other. Okay, uh, and those who master both, they are Majmal Bahrain, uh, uh, people who uh, brought together two oceans in themselves. Uh, you know, uh, so in Arabic, Wahatani Tariqatan. You know, there are two methods to truth. Uh, minha istidlal. The first one is the uh, method of demonstration, you know, proving something through rational or empirical evidence. And the other is like inner, uh, inner uh, witnessing, you know, witnessing in the heart. The first one is the method of the uh, scholars, rational scholars. Uh, the other is the uh, level of the uh, 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 you know, uh, saints. Uh, so each path leads you at the end to the other one. So each path leads you at the end to the other one. 
you know, so th that person, the Mejmal Bahrain, the one who collected two oceans in, two knowledge of oceans, you know, in himself. So he applies al istidlal wal mushahada. You know, he has ilm and irfan. He has shahada and ghaib uh, together in his uh, person. Of course, there's a long explanation. We cannot uh, go into details. Uh, so let's conclude. Uh, uh, all theories and methods are grounded upon a worldview. Uh, positivist and interpretivist theories are products of certain assumptions about being and knowledge, you know, ontology and epistemology. The conception of a multi-layered worldview lead to a non-reductionist ontology, epistemology, and methodology. Multiplexity as a research paradigm offers an alternative to the hegemonic reductionist paradigm of science. And Islamic education must be based on this multiplex uh, perspective. Of course, in, we have to compare it with the existing uh, perspectives as well. So this is what we try to teach at Usul Academy. You know, uh, and also uh, in my theory courses, uh, whether at Ibn Khaldun University in other places, uh, you know, uh, I try to uh, uh, revive uh, the multiplex perspective based on maratibul wujud, maratibul ulum, maratibul usul. But unfortunately, due to uh, colonization uh, of our social science education, we completely forgot this multiplex uh, perspective. Now our duty is rooted revival. You know, we have to revive this uh, multiplex uh, ontology, epistemology, and methodology, and build our theories on these uh, uh, philosophical uh, foundations, uh, uh, inshallah ta'ala. And this is what makes education Islamic. You know, if education is based on positivist uh, worldview uh, or idealist worldview, this is not Islamic. Uh, it should be based on the multiplex perspective, maratibul wujud, maratibul ulum, maratibul usul. So that's the first prerequisite to make education Islamic. That's the first prerequisite to make a philosophy, a thinking uh, Islamic. Uh, 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 and today, uh, this multiplex perspective is very much needed in the whole world, not just by Muslims, by non-Muslims uh, as well, because uh, Non-Muslims now, you know, uh, they are confused, you know, with the postmodern uh, paradigm, which claims that there is no truth. We should tell them, no, there is truth and it's multiplex. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Professor um, David Sandberg, um, for the lecture. It's been thoroughly. Um, mesmerizing, it's really enlightening um, to have kind of come across this. Um, I must admit, I haven't come across this um, particular approach. So it is um, very much something uh, uh, myself, uh, I need to immerse myself in, in terms of discovering um, that the, 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 the uniplex world that we have kind of been taught in, that we've been brought up in, has given us a certain certain world perspective, and and it, it seems to kind of divorce us from any other possibility of a different approach existing to acquiring knowledge, to acquiring uh, sense perception, acquiring wisdom, um, perhaps interpreting the world in a different way. So uh, I really like to thank you on behalf of everyone here for giving us and uh, exposing us to a, a multiplex kind of um, view, a comprehensive approach to acquiring knowledge um, and, and appreciating wisdom, which has escaped, um, if you like, mankind um, for a long time. So we are kind of in a very tunnel vision world, tunnel vision world where we see knowledge and doing things in one particular way uh, to the exclusion of the of others other 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 ways and or other systems or uh, other methods of uh, inquiry so thank you thank you for that um i'd like 
I would now like to ask um, our participants to um, ask questions. And if, if I may ask, can you please make the questions short so, so that as many people as possible can, could have a chance to ask uh, Professor Sentok um, to uh, explain some things. I know it was a bit heavy in terms of theory, but uh, this is the first lecture, so bear with us. Um, we will delve into more evidence-based arguments in, in, in the later um, lectures, uh, so that um, one may think that, you know, uh, we were, talk, were gonna talk about decolonizing social science, uh, but we kind of just went into a very theoretical lecture, but I think it was necessary. So please ask your questions, raise your hands, and um, uh, we'll fire away. Awesome, can I ask you a question, please? Of course you may. Okay, uh, starting professor, thank you so much. Uh, very enlightening. To be honest, uh, uh, the way you explained that those uh, differences between these, uh, uh, the contemporary social science and the Islamic way of looking into it is, is kind of mind blowing. Uh, but to be honest with you, as you said already, that uh, the multiplex system is a bit of, uh, is a bit complex. Uh, it seemed to me a bit complex too, to be honest, because uh, there are so many things and so many layers because it's built on layers, right? Yes. Uh, it's not like one layer as we as you can see in the contemporary social science. So, I mean, I mean, sometimes is it possible to make it uh, a bit, for example, for, for a layman who can, you know, not an academic, for a general public who is interested in understanding um, social science based on Islamic perspective, is it possible to make it? easy way, two, three sentences defining it so that we all can understand it easily. How would you, how would you uh, put, put the definition of that kind of uh, way? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, 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 be, because uh, I was trying to uh, present uh, from a comparative perspective. Uh, so I had to present the existing uh, hegemonic or the uh, dominant uh, perspectives the positivist, idealist, and the multiplex perspectives at the same time. So this kind of like loaded, you know, <laughs> too much uh, information at once. Uh, uh, but uh, without uh, making such a comparison, one wouldn't appreciate, you know, uh, the value of having uh, uh, such a multiplex uh, perspective. Uh, uh, you have to compare it with those reductionist uniplex uh, perspectives. And uh, usually, uh, we are uh, presented in our education. That's the only scientific way of uh, of uh, you know approaching uh, uh, reality. But uh, first, I relativized what's in the West, you know, what's in the modern world. You know that there are different uh, perspectives. Uh, uh, people uh, argue uh, scientific. Uh, and then, you know, uh, embed uh, Islamic perspective based on the multiplexity in that uh, picture uh, as well. Uh, but uh, actually, it's very simple, you know, uh, that there are multiple levels of existence and there are multiple levels of knowledge and there are multiple types of method to study each uh, level of existence. Uh, so very simple. Uh, and actually, uh, every Muslim believes in the multiple levels of existence. Because when you read Fatiha, what's the first verse? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. You know, uh, thanks and praise be to the Lord of the universes. So basically, like the first verse teaches you that there are multiple universes. It's not just material world. It's not just, you know, a metaphysical world. There are many universes. Uh, so it opens up your uh, horizons to the uh, multiple levels of existence. And the same way, in the beginning of the uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, it says, you know, they believe in the unseen. Again, you know, it opens up your ontological perspective, you know, your perspective to the world, that there is visible world and the alam al the non-visible world uh, as well. Uh, so this is very simple, you know, uh, and it's already ingrained, you know, in our thinking, uh, but I, presented it in a systematic way, the way our scholars uh, systematized it. You know, uh, they called the Quranic view, uh, the prophetic view, maratibul wujud. 
uh, you know, that uh, reality has multiple levels, but for each uh, uh, level of reality, there is a particular method to study it. Our modern education, the uh, positivist education teaches us there can be only one single scientific method. Why? You know, how can you have a single scientific method to study everything? You know, uh, you know if there are different objects, then uh, depending on the nature of that object, you should use different methods. How can you study stones and human beings with the same method? See what I mean? <laughs> How can you study a uh, visible world and the alim al ghaib with the same method? You know, uh, these are different levels of existence. So that's why you need different uh, methods, you know, uh, depending on the subject to study. So basically, I mean, the positive science or the idealist science gives you one tool and then tells you fix all your problems with this single tool. But Islamic multiplex approach gives you a toolbox. You know, okay, use the tool that's appropriate uh, for your problem. You know, uh, so that's why it is not uh, uniplex. It's not reductionist. You know, uh, it's giving you different sources of knowledge depending on what subject you are studying. It gives you different methods depending on the subject you are uh, studying. Uh, so this is what I call ontological pluralism, mm -hmm. epistemological pluralism, and methodological pluralism. You know, uh, depending on the subject you are studying, you know, uh, you can use a different uh, type of epistemology and methodology, uh, but without rejecting uh, the possibility of the other uh, perspectives on reality, the possibility of other uh, types of knowledge, you know, uh, the possibility of uh, methods that are appropriate to be used in other subjects. But uh, this uh, materialist or idealist perspective teaches us there is a single level of reality, there is a single type of scientific knowledge, and there's a single type of scientific method to be used everywhere. This is uh, injustice you know, to the reality in which we are living. You know, reality is more sophisticated than this. You know, uh, so that's a simple way of uh, explaining it. Uh, uh, inshallah, Taala. Well, a number of uh, number of questions in the chat, but before I take those, um, may I take the ones uh, where the people have put their hand up? So may I ask Nadia Shah to unmute yourself and ask the question, please. So, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, thank you for a very informative uh, lecture. Um, my question is, um, so how is the multiplex ontology different from a constructive paradigm? Because constructive paradigm is very different from the positivist paradigm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yes, this is a very good uh, question. Uh, the con constructivist paradigm uh, argues that social reality is completely constructed by human beings. And the poesis paradigm argues, no, it is given similar to nature. Nothing is constructed by human beings. And uh, both are reductionist. You know? But uh, from the multiplex perspective, you know, one level of social reality is uh, given by God, is created by God, you know, uh, is similar to nature. But the other level of social reality is constructed by human beings. You know, uh, so we cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 adopt a reductionist perspective, arguing all social reality is constructed. You know, uh, this is, you know, uh, extremist. And then the other extreme is nothing is socially constructed. You know, <laughs> of course, there is something that's, you know, we construct, you know, I mean, like we create state, we create economy, you know, uh, I mean, uh, these are all human constructions, but, you know, uh, there are certain things that are given, they are there, you know, uh, uh, so not everything is product of a human mind, you know, there is objective uh, level of social reality as well, not everything is subjective, uh, uh, so, 
so that's the difference between uh, objective and between uh, positivist, uh, idealist, and multiplex uh, perspectives. Uh, so idealist and materialist, you know, they are trying to reduce uh, social uh, reality into a single type. But the, the multiplex perspective recognizes that uh, you know uh, uh, these are not mutually exclusive. You know, they are different uh, aspects of the social reality we are uh, studying. What they are doing, similar to the uh, people who touched the elephant in the dark room, in the story of Mevlana Jalatun Rumi, you know, uh, they uh, capture only one aspect of reality and they argue that's it. You know, uh, this, this is all, uh, but multiplex uh, perspective, you know, is more uh, 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 comprehensive, inclusive, and holistic. Thank you for the Thank answer. You. We've got another question from um, Wazir Baksh. Is that, if I don't know that I've um, uh, pronounced his name correctly. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? We've got some other people as well. So uh, if we can make the answers as succinct as possible so we can get more people in as well. Okay. Brother Wazir Baksh, can you hear me? Yes, I'm, I can hear you. Do you hear me? I can. I'm far away. Go ahead. You can hear me now? Yes, yes, yes we hear you. Okay. Um, my point is that um, in my reading of texts, I mean, it could be Shawalil, Ibn Khaldun, or what have you, um, and even Western uh, thinkers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, etc. Um, they are describing um, theories and thoughts that was never implemented because they were reacting to the reality that they face in their environment at that particular time in history. Um, I am wondering, and we we accept them as theories, um, but we have to put them in somewhere to make them workable, practical. Because how do we use Shawalia and Hujata Balita, what you wrote there, um, even Khaldun, what you wrote? I mean, he raised a lot of theories, and my background is in history and social science. So I read even Khaldun a lot. I mean, he said a lot of good things, but how do we put them together um, to make? Uh, a, a program for action that we could implement wherever it is. How do we, um, you know, the, the his beer as described in Khaldun, how do we use it today? Not yes. in respect to blood relation, but I'm looking more um, in yes. social relation among people, you know, the interconnection yes. among people because yes. families yeah, break up and travel and so forth. Yes, thank you for this uh, question. As I have mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, we need theories for two things. First, understanding social reality. Second, regulating, organizing, controlling social life. Uh, so uh, theories offers us explanations and interpretations of the social reality in which we are embedded. Uh, these explanations and uh, interpretations help us better organize uh, social life. Uh, so Ibn Khaldun has like theories about uh, economy. Uh, so he argues that uh, taxes should be kept minimum so that society can prosper more. So uh, this is a theoretical perspective and it is advocated by uh, many people even today. Uh, uh, and a good example for this was uh, Ronald Reagan. You know, he was always citing Ibn Khaldun uh, that uh, taxes should be kept minimum uh, so that people can uh, prosper more. Uh, so this one uh, theory that's even today is considered for implementation. <laughs> Another, yeah. uh, another uh, theory he has, he argues that state should not be involved in economic activity. Uh, he says this is uh, because this creates 
asymmetric competition. You know, you know, there is a state and then there are individuals who are trying to do business. How can they compete with each other? So, uh, so this another uh, argument, uh, uh, you know, that the state should not uh, uh, be involved in economic activity and let people, you know, do economic. So all these theories are still, uh, you know, uh, uh, discussed uh, and uh, some of them are still being uh, implemented. And I can give you many other uh, examples. Uh, this is what I call applied Haldunism. Applied Haldunism. So it is uh, today, uh, it's very uh, valid. It, it, they are not just, you know, uh, intellectual gymnastic, you know. Uh, I mean, uh, they have uh, practical implications. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, inshallah, uh, the last lecture of this series will be about practical implications in ethics and human rights. Okay, may I ask this as I'm here, um, the rate of change today is happening before you anticipate, I mean, globally, the what we call the postmodern world with intervention of internet and what have you. Um, how do we anticipate the future, what it could be, what it can be in our, Pursuit because the way how um, I see um, generally yeah, Ibn Haldun has a good uh, has Ibn Haldun has a good answer to this. He uh, says, "Al ati ashbahu bil maadi min al maai bil maai." So he argues that the the future is more similar to the past than a similarity of a drop of water to another drop of water. So if you study the present and the past and understand it, then you can make better predictions about the future. Okay, then, thanks. You are welcome. Unmute yourself and um, please ask your question. Can so, you hear me? So uh, who... who who, who do you want uh, to ask the question? No, no, no. We've got uh, a participant who uh, wanted to ask a question. I've asked him to unmute and ask a question. Okay, Ainul Mardia. Ainul Mardia. Yes. Assalamu uh, alaikum, Prof. Alaikum salam. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm Ainul from Indonesia, currently study in UK. So, uh, May Allah give you the best success. What do you study? Psychology. Very good. <laughs> yeah, I try to develop like Islamic self-management illness. <laughs> I use like a brother human uh, books to. Mashallah, mashallah, very good. To so develop he, like the... he's the he's the best one, uh, you know, uh, to learn from and follow. Yeah. <laughs> um, the problem is <laughs> when I try to come up with this i this idea like like Islamic ontology and things like that is I got um, um, rejected in a way <laughs> that it's not makes sense to my um, my lead professor mm -hmm. because because he says like we are atheists we don't understand um, yes. your opinion so my question is quite practical so how do we promote Mm -hmm. or share this kind of ontology and epistemology mm -hmm. to people who have no religious background? Okay, very good question. Uh, I mean, as I have mentioned, empirical research is part of the multiplex methodology. You know, uh, so, uh, I mean, you can do empirical research with your professors and write your thesis using empirical uh, methods I mean, there is nothing wrong, you know, using uh, empirical methods. But what would be wrong is to argue that we can know everything through empirical methods. You know, if you reject room of uh, reasoning, if you reject the room for uh, divine revelation, uh, then that would be wrong. So, you know, uh, you can do uh, empirical research. As I said, uh, Nazar Akli, uh, rational, uh, not pure rationality, is the common ground between Muslims and non-Muslims. 
you know, uh, so uh, when you uh, work with non-Muslims, uh, don't bring in like Quran or Hadith, just rely on, you know, pure reasoning and empirical research and do your work uh, by this because it is part of the uh, multiplex uh, methodology uh, and Muslims uh, did empiric research uh, in the past and even today, and we are required to do it, is part of our multiplex uh, methodology. Uh, and also, you know, Prophet Muhammad said, speak to people the way they understand. You know, uh, so, uh, I mean, it would not be easy, you know, for somebody who's trained all his life you know, with positivist uh, methodology to understand the multiplex uh, methodology right away. So it might take some time, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, and also you are a student, uh, that's uh, an asymmetric relationship, you know, between professor and the student. Sometimes professors are not inclined to learn from the students. So inshallah, when you become a professor, you teach your students this uh, methodology. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, uh, just follow the empirical uh, methods and do your uh, thesis. Uh, and inshallah, in the future, you know, uh, when you become equal uh, to them, then you can better explain and they respect your uh, views more uh, at the time. Okay, okay. But the problem, sorry. <laughs> But the problem is my my subject of study is Indonesian, Muslim Indonesian. And then it's about, I mean, like talking about spiritual needs of cancer patients. So I try to communicate the Muslim needs to the... Yes. Yeah, yeah. so need. if, uh, I mean, if your professor disagree with, you know, you studying this subject, change it. You know, think <laughs> practically, you know, uh, do something else. <laughs> <laughs> then you do you do uh, the kinds of work like you want to do after you have your PhD. Then you'll be free, inshallah. <laughs> but it's you know. But, but you know, when you are a student, you know, you are uh, uh, you have to follow the uh, guidelines. You know where you are uh, studying, uh, and then when you become independent and free, you do whatever you want to do. So be practical at the moment. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, before I take the next verbal question, if I may take a question from the chat, um, I might have to rephrase it and the uh, questioner might, might want to come back. The question goes like this. Western knowledge and culture is linked to the first two layers. So to fill the gap between reality and the current theory, theory is the addition of third layer I don't know whether this is a question or not. I'm going to skip that one and go to another question. So I don't think this is a question. How do how do we Islam, Islamize the knowledge? Is it possible within the existing system that's based on a certain thought, or the entire system will have to be changed to achieve this objective? I take it to mean: Do we? I mean, can can the Islamic knowledge base exist? Uh, within the current system, or does it fit along with it, side by uh, side? Or, yes. Uh, or has the current yeah. system of knowledge come, become a subset of the Islamic mm -hmm. knowledge? Because what you've described in the multiplex system is that the, mm -hmm. the, the, the current, current way of acquiring knowledge and the established norm of yes. you know, uh, validating knowledge is it appears to be a subset of what you've described. So I don't know how you would like to address it. Yes. Uh, uh, as I have uh, already explained uh, to the uh, question uh, of uh, our uh, psychologist friend, uh, uh, so uh, the, the current scientific activities, they are not completely rejected from the multiplex perspective. Because multiplex perspective, as I have already explained, uh, incorporates empirical methods, rational methods, in the field of natural sciences, philosophy, math, etc. But uh, when it comes to fiqh and kalam, you know, uh, uh, it uses uh, religious rationality, incorporating, you know, reason, sense perception, and wahi. You know, but uh, uh, outside 
of fiqh and kalam, you know, uh, it uh, tells you, okay, use your uh, reason and empirical research. So today, you know, uh, scientists, they do empirical research. We have no problem if something is empirically proven. You know, we have to accept it. And if you are doing a, a research in natural sciences, you have to use empirical methods. Uh, and uh, because empirical method is part of the multiplex methodology. And uh, actually Muslims, uh, even in the past, you know, uh, they develop empirical methods uh, based on sense perception, based on using their uh, reasoning. And uh, this is the common ground between us and non-Muslims. You know, we can do empirical research together with them, or we can accept their findings uh, through empirical research. There is nothing wrong with that, you know. But when it comes to interpretation of those uh, facts, you know, we can have our own interpretation because even they themselves, they disagree among themselves with respect to the interpretation of the findings, right? So the idealists interpret in a particular way, materialists interpret in a different way, like the Marxists interpret in a different way, you know, uh, uh, Foucauldians interpreted in a different way. So we can have our own interpretation. So we should accept empirically or rationally proven facts and make our own interpretation according to our own worldview and values. Uh, uh, so uh, multiplex perspective does not tell us to reject, you know, uh, everything uh, done by uh, non-Muslims. Uh, and when you uh, look at the past, you know, we incorporated uh, many things from Greek civilization, Indian civilization, Persian civilization, you know, those empirically proven facts. You know, uh, so uh, because it's part of our uh, methodology. Thank you, Professor. I think I, I thank our participants for bearing with us. Uh, it's been a rather long session, but it's been interesting. So I'd like to ask now, um, Mutiur Rahman, if you'd like to ask the question, and do apologize for the long wait. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Uh, it's it's been such a lovely lecture, and this is like. Um, what I've been uh, piecing up from studies all over the classic text that's been summarized, Professor. So Alhamdulillah, lovely job. Um, in terms of the question would be, uh, from what I gather, both um, empiricism and idealism is reductionism because this is sort of um, inside the boundaries of human knowledge. Um, what would you think, um, would you distinguish between ontology, the real ontology being the hakika, which is beyond human knowledge, and also sort of um, the nazar ontology, sort of the second level of human reasons. And uh, at the moment, because human reason cannot uh, go into now the real ontology, the real nature of things, Western current paradigms of science are reductionism. And so in order to know real ontology, uh, not the human ontology, is to sort of um, go beyond uh, our current sort of paradigms of science. So would you distinguish between Hakika and the current human ontology when they talk about ontology? Yes, uh, uh, so this is a very good uh, question. And uh, uh, I think uh, Imam Ghazali's Al Munkusu Min Ad Dalal, you know, presents us a good uh, example uh, for this. Uh, so he explored uh, rationality as a way to truth, but he came to realize that rationality has limits. And then he explored empiricism, and at the end, he came to realize that empiricism also has limits. Then he explored spirituality. You know, uh, and he concluded that uh, the ultimate understanding of reality comes from uh, spirituality, from uh, tasawwuf. But he did not trash rationality. He did not trash empiricism. He said they have their legitimate domain, but they have their limitations. You know, uh, so uh, in his books on ilmi kalam. And Fuku, he used rationality, you know, uh, 
uh, but he also uh, made the students aware that uh, rationality and uh, empirical methods, they are not going to take you to the ultimate understanding of uh, existence. Uh, so you need hakika, and hakika is something uh, uh, you know uh, gifted by Allah Taala. It is ilm wahbi. You know there is ilm kasbi uh, that we acquire through studying and contemplating. Uh, or through uh, rational evidence or empirical evidence, this is it, istidlal, you know, uh, uh, and this is what Fakhreddin Razi said, and also Tashko Prizade said, you know, which I cited in my presentation. Uh, so this istidlal, istidlal is legitimate, is respected, you know, but it has its limitations. Uh, uh, but true uh, understanding of uh, reality uh, can be achieved through this spiritual uh, experience. Fattakullah uh, So Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, have taqwa, then Allah will teach you. That's the special type of knowledge, which is the highest level of uh, knowledge. May Allah bless us with that kind of uh, knowledge. That's the knowledge of uh, Hakika. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, um, Professor. Go, we've got a further question from uh, Matt Basila. Can you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Yes, uh, uh, hello, Professor. Assalamu alaikum. Um, uh, uh, the whole uh, multiplex method uh, sounds very good, and, and I'm, I, I wanted to ask about some uh, examples of implementation of this method in a social sciences as actual research method and, and, and uh, how does it work uh, on the level of academia? Because uh, it sounds great on paper, but I hope we can actually use it and implement it. Inshallah, inshallah. You know, uh, uh, you know the, this is the question I will address in the uh, upcoming uh, talks like how you uh, implement it in social research. Uh, so a good example may be in uh, uh, like a psychology, how human action is produced. Uh, so we, we human beings, we are constituted by our body, mind and soul. And human action is a co-production of body, mind and soul. You know, uh, so when you explain why people do what they are doing, uh, you have to explain the physical causes, mental causes, and the spiritual causes, you know, behind human uh, action. So this is how you can implement it in the practical research. Uh, uh, but sometimes in your research, you may focus only on the physical causes. Uh, and this is like, uh, you know, uh, 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 like medicine, let's say, uh, or uh, some part of like behavior psychology in empiricist research. But sometimes you may focus on the mental causes behind like human action, and sometimes you may focus on the spiritual uh, causes of human action. But when you bring all of them together, then you have a holistic, comprehensive, uh, hakika understanding of what causes human action and how human action is uh, produced. Uh, uh, so this is uh, what you may do in the practical research. And inshallah, in the upcoming lectures, we will discuss these in further detail with more concrete examples. So we've got further question from Shafir Rahman. Can you please ask a question now if you can? Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khairan, um, Professor, um, for that presentation. It's really um, insightful and useful. Just a quick, two quick questions. The first one is, what is the reasoning of, I, I understand the multiplex and, and all of the um, complexities of multi-leveled reality and the sources of knowledge, etc. cetera. Um, I'm just wondering what's the reason behind um, privileging or foregrounding tasawwuf or um, kashf or ilham within that methodology that looks at 
really social sciences or realities. I can understand it when it comes to um, purification, tazkiyah, gaining nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or when Imam Ghazali is criticizing istidlal, that is more in relation to knowledge of God, knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, he's saying his experience of fiqh and, and the formal um, rituals, etc., has a limit. So that has to be dhok, tasted, etc. But is there a problem of making that a source of knowledge? Because it's very subjective, very private, very hard to interpret sometimes. And that's why you get wild claims from sometimes people of tasawwuf, you know, someone saying, I, I go back and learn from Abu Hanifa 20 times per month. Um, this is my kashf and ilham, etc. As you know, it has no place in usul al fiqh and other, other sciences. So I'm just wondering about that, that question. And my second question very quickly is, do you have any opinions of uh, the approach of Ma Martin Heidegger in terms of phenomenology and, and his other third kind of way of looking at real reality? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, these are important uh, issues uh, we need to discuss. I'm not for grounding uh, tasawwuf or other uh, disciplines. And actually, none of our uh, scholars foregrounded, you know, tasawwuf or other disciplines. Like I cited uh, Fahrettin Razi, Taj Köprüzadeh, Imam Ghazali. None of them, you know, uh, foregrounded, uh, you know, tasawwuf. Uh, uh, at the exclusion of other disciplines. Uh, uh, so every discipline has a particular domain where it should be used. You know, uh, so Kalam has its uh, uh, domain and Fukr has its domain. And the last book Imam Ghazali wrote is Al Mustasfa, you know, which is on Usul al Fukr, methodology of Fukr. And it's based on uh, reasoning, Nazar. You know, it was not like a tasawuf book uh, uh, because, uh, as you have already mentioned, uh, you know, uh, kashf, uh, ru'ya, ilham, etc. These are subjective sources of knowledge. They are not binding. They cannot be used in uh, public life. You know, uh, uh, so, as I have mentioned in my presentation, these are subjective sources of knowledge. They are private and personal. You cannot base any public argument on these sources of knowledge. Like you cannot base any fatwa, you know, on your dream, on your cash. You know, uh, these are not acceptable in our uh, fukr. You know, usul fukr has very rational methodology, right? You have to use those rational uh, methods when you uh, issue a fatwa or, uh, uh, you know, uh, issue uh, a hukum. Uh, uh, so public life, you know, is grounded on these rational uh, uh, principles. Uh, so uh, uh, th these methods are uh, all used in support of each other. They complement uh, each uh, other, uh, but uh, subjectivity uh, cannot be excluded from epistemology. I mean, the positivists, they argue uh, there is no room for subjectivity. And the postmodernists argue the opposite. They say everything is subjective. You know, uh, so uh, this multiplex perspective brings together subjectivity and objectivity and defines the domains, the appropriate domains where subjectivity uh, exists and can be used, and the uh, domain where objectivity uh, exist and uh, it's appropriate to use the objective uh, perspective. Uh, uh, so this multiplex perspective uh, does not privilege uh, one uh, method at the expense of others. Uh, instead, it argues that these different methods complement uh, each other. I'm very familiar with Heidegger's uh, ontology and methodology this uh, uh, phenomenological uh, perspective. Uh, uh, so he's after like meaning of uh, existence, uh, but uh, he didn't uh, ultimately answer what's the meaning of our existence. You know, uh, 
I mean, uh, of course, he touches some important uh, issues and explores some important questions, but he could not give the ultimate answer about ultimate meaning of our existence. You know, uh, uh, so again, you know, he addressed you know one level of existence, this idealist uh, perspective. He's a good, great philosopher, but as I said, we don't need to reject. Uh, the good insights, empirically or rationally proven insights, you know, uh, they have a room in this multiplex uh, perspective. I mean, uh, uh, we share many things with the idealist. The only thing we disagree with them, we are not reductionist. You know, uh, we don't say everything is in our mind. You know, uh, <laughs> but there are something in our mind. And we take it seriously. So, I mean, we are as materialist as the materialist, but the difference is that we are not reductionist. We don't say, you know, materialism is enough for us. We don't care about the rest. We are idealist as idealist, but the only difference is that we are not reductionist. I mean, we don't reject the material reality. We, we don't say, you know, uh, ideal reality is everything. Uh, so Heidegger is good, and there are things to learn from Heidegger, except his reductionism. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, once again for a um, thorough answer. Um, um, I guess we, we need to conclude soon, uh, unless we have more questions. But what I've taken from your um, uh, is your ground laying lecture today is um, is the fact that there are different ways of seeing the world, different ways of interpreting experience, different ways of explaining how humans and relate to other humans, how humans relate to their environment, how the humans relate to the spiritual world. Uh, and um, it, it is kind of the Islamic approach does not dismiss uh, the prevalent way of acquiring knowledge, but it, it, it kind of brings it in under its fold and it says yes that's acceptable also but there is there are other ways to look at things and uh, so let's not exclude those and as you said some of the other ways of looking at knowledge is not necessarily binding but it, it enhances the human experience but the human sensitivity to what's what's kind of around uh, in terms of uh, what is observable and what is not observ observable but there are, but we know that, you know, like you said, I mean, I just made a note here that there are different ways of um, kind of looking at it. You can look at it, uh, look at patterns. You can then establish some sort of uh, theory and then uh, you, can, you, can, you, can, um, uh, you can see if the theory, um, the, 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 the evidence holds up, up, up uh, up to the theory, or you can look at the theory. If so, I mean, the way I look at it is, if you look at the revealed knowledge, is it, it is a certain kind of theory, and, there, and then there's evidence here. Now, does the evidence match up to the revealed theory that is given? If it doesn't, you reject it. If it does match, then you accept it. So there are kind of different ways of approaching it. So I think you've, you've certainly enlightened me today in terms of looking at knowledge in, from different perspectives. And I'm sure our participants have enjoyed it today as well. So um, is there, do you want to summarize for us like two or three points that we might want to take away from this lecture today so that we can come prepared for the next one? Is there okay, uh, all right. The, the summary uh, of the lecture is that, uh, I mean, uh, your ontology determines your epistemology which determines your uh, methodology. Uh, and uh, we uh, accept uh, multiplex ontology, which uh, leads us to multiplex epistemology, which leads us to multiplex uh, uh, methodology. And multiplex uh, uh, worldview is comprehensive, inclusive, holistic, and it does not require us to reject the proven uh, insights and findings of uh, materialist or idealist perspective, uh, except that we disagree with them 
uh, with regard to their reductionism. So uh, that's the uh, summary uh, of this uh, lecture. Thank you very much. I think I, I'm, I, I again like to um, really thank our participants and especially yourself uh, for sharing your knowledge with us today. And um, so thank you, Professor Center, um, Recep Center for the lecture. We hope our audience have enjoyed it as much as I have. And um, thank, you, thank you to everyone for making comments and um, making this event very lively and, uh, and contributing your thoughts and ideas and your questions. Our next lecture will be on the 28th of March and the topic will be rethinking social sciences beyond the canon. We thank Professor Recep Center for delivering this lecture. We thank you all for taking part. And so we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.